morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about uh, yeah, cold uh, chemistry, and we're going to look into three-body recombination and explore propensity rules. Uh, this work is a collaboration of uh, theorists, and uh, Jose is here. Uh, Paul Julian has been here. Jing Lun is not here. Well, he's in Ulm. And Eber Thiemann is in Hanover. And this is the experimental team in Ulm. And Shinska Hase essentially did all the measurements. So I want to talk about state-to-state -state chemistry. I want to talk about three-body recombination. Say you have three atoms and you prepare them in well-defined quantum states. And now they react in three-body recombination. They produce a molecule. And, and you want to ask, yeah, what is the quantum state of this molecule? And there can be actually thousands of, uh, of states that this molecule can be in. And we are asking the question, are there any simple rules? Yeah? And the chemists uh, chemist say, are there propensity rules for certain states to go into? So that's what we want to measure. And I just want to remind you, of course, when you have a molecule, you have all these degrees of freedom. You have the vibrational degree of freedom. You have the rotation of the molecule, and you have the hyperfine state. And we can measure this in our experiment uh, by state selectively ionizing these molecules. And we can also come from the theory side, uh, doing multi-channel calculations using this hyperspherical adiabatic approach. You can, you can calculate these uh, distributions for the different products. And of course, there will be some approximations have to be done because the, the system is so you know, complex and large. Okay, but I want to focus more on the experiment, of course. And I first uh, want to tell you a little bit how we detect these molecules. So this is the rubidium molecule down here that we produce. Yeah, you have the triplet uh, potential, you have the singlet potential, plenty of levels. And we probe these molecules with REMPI, Resonance Enhanced Multi-Photon Ionization, where you do go in a, in a two-step uh, photon excitation, you ionize this rubidium, and you have an intermediate state here. And actually, we have uh, two paths here. You see one path is probing the singlet, uh, um, yeah, singlet molecules, and the other path is probing triplet molecules. And here you have, uh, you know, all this, these bound state levels that we want to investigate. And so you have a vibrational quantum number. You have the rotation of the molecule, LR. And then you have the hyperfine structure. And we will use the atomic basis for the hyperfine structure. So FA is the total angular momentum of the atom A, including nuclear spin, and FB is the same for atom B, and big F is the sum of FA and FB. Yeah, and then the intermediate state that we go resonantly through, um, this one actually has a negligible hyperfine structure, so it's essentially just a pure rotational ladder. It's, it's well known, you know, we have done spectroscopy, we know exactly where they are located. Okay, um, so once we have ionized these molecules, yeah, they are ions, and then we want to detect them. In the first step, we trap them in a Paul trap with 100% efficiency, and this is, happens exactly where these, where these molecules and the ions were produced. Yeah? So here you have this ion, and you also have atoms close by. And then we count these ions, and we have our own way of doing this, yeah, we immerse these ions into a cloud of atom, and then these ions in the Paul trap, they jiggle around a little bit, they elastically collide with the atoms and kick the atoms out, and after a certain time, you are left with a certain fraction of atoms, and that's what you measure, how many atoms are left. And then, uh, you know, depending on how big the loss is, you can tell how many ions you had. So here, you have uh, a typical scan. Yeah, this is the, the the remaining fraction of atoms. 
So whenever you have a, you know, um, like a dip here, loss of atoms, that is a signal for a molecule um, in a particular quantum state. So you see here, we, we scan on the x-axis the laser frequency. So these are these uh, lasers here. And by this, you scan over those um, molecular bound state levels. And whenever you hit a bound state level and there are some molecules there, you pick them off and, and you turn them into ions and that leads to these losses. And um, so you see, we have signals for, the, for the singlet molecules and for, for triplet molecules. And I want to tell you that uh, with our scheme, we can really cover all possible molecular bound states. So we can detect anything that exists. So today I want to talk about propensity rules. And uh, recently we have done some uh, two experiments in that direction. So one is about spin conservation in three body recombination. And I'm gonna yeah, focus on that in my talk um, and tell you what this is about. Then there's a second topic um, and there we investigate so if you produce a molecule with a binding energy EB, what's the probability to produce it? And, and we find that there's a simple scaling law, yeah, the deeper the molecule is bound, uh, yeah, the less probable it is to produce this molecule. And actually there's a simple scaling law here where the probability goes like one over the binding energy and yeah, to the power of 0.8. And unfortunately, I noticed that I don't have the time to really go into this experiment. Um, so, but I just want to flash this slide here. These are some data that we measure. Um, so here you see molecular signals. And uh, so this is a molecular signal with a vibrational quantum number minus two. You, we count from the threshold down. Yeah, it has a binding energy of half a gigahertz or so. And then here you go down in binding energy, and we go all the way down to about 80 gigahertz of binding energy, and that corresponds to a vibrational level of minus eight. Yeah, so um, so quite a range of molecules that we can detect. Here we have quantum numbers L equals zero and L equals two. So uh, a molecule that is not rotating and the molecule that is rotating with two units of angular momentum. But you clearly see how the signal goes down. Yeah, until you basically don't see it anymore. We can amplify this or scale it up by a factor of 10. You still see that we have nice signals yeah, and you can easily believe that we uh, you know, have a propensity rule like this. And uh, we get this propensity rule not only um, from, from our experiments, but also from our theoretical calculations. So now back to experiment number one, yeah? So we are interested now in spin conservation. What do I mean by this? Let's say we have these two atoms, A, B, yeah? We prepared them in a quantum number F, A, and F, B equal to two. And let's say the total F is four. Um, and if now the molecule that is formed from these two yeah, is also has the same quantum numbers, then, then we say, we have spin con, uh, con, uh, conservation. And atom C, of course, is just a bystander with respect to spin. Yeah? There is no spin exchange between A and B and C. And uh, I just want to uh, point out, yeah, there are, if you start out with something like this, there are actually quite a number of spin channels you could go into. Yeah? For Vidium 85, there's 12 possible spin channels yeah? for, for these pairs. Yeah? So, you have F could be two or three, yeah, and then big F can run between zero and six. Okay, and I haven't even discussed the magnetic quantum number. So a couple of years ago, we did observe this kind of spin propensity for the three body recombination of rubidium 87. But yeah, rubidium 87 is really special. And that is because the scattering lengths for the singlet potential and for the triplet potential are essentially the same. They're around 100 Bohr. And so then it's known that these spin exchange processes are strongly suppressed. So we were asking ourselves, so this is nice, but how general is this spin propensity rule? And uh, so how does it work for other species? For example, does it work for rubidium 
85. Yeah? And rubidium 85 really has very different skin uh, scattering properties as compared to rubidium 87. It has a large singlet scattering length and it has a large and negative uh, triplet scattering length. And the three body recombination rate constant is four orders of magnitude larger than for rubidium 87. So it's really quite different. So we set out uh, for these experiments, yeah, prepared rubidium 85 atoms, 300,000 or so, at a temperature of about 900 nanokelvin. We have a couple of Gauss of magnetic field, and we choose this spin state to work with. So here you have the hyperfine levels of rubidium 85. And so this is the magnetic quantum number that we choose. It has the advantage if you have a two-body collision between two atoms, uh, you know, this spin state is essentially stable. Yeah? So you can nicely prepare your sample. So now let's have a look at our two atoms, A and B. Yeah? They are prepared in these spin states. And of course, yeah, then the pair has a MF quantum number, magnetic quantum number of minus four. And that also sets the big F quantum number to be four. Yeah? So we have really all these quantum numbers nicely set down. And uh, I'm just telling you now, when we do the experiments, we find that the molecule has precisely the same quantum numbers in our experiments. So just like rubidium 87, rubidium 85 showed the same spin conservation propensity rule, although it had these very different um, scattering properties. So let's have a quick look at the data. Yeah, so you see there's all these lines here. And um, so um, when, and you see these vertical lines here, these are calculations from a multi-channel calculation. So theory where we expect signals uh, could occur. And wherever we have a line like this, we know exactly what molecular quantum state that would be. Here you see the quantum number uh, V, yeah? so that's the vibrational quantum number. And these numbers tell you what the vibrational quantum numbers are. They go from minus one to minus four. Yeah, corresponding to about 10 gigahertz or so of binding energy. And there's also information about what the rotation of these molecules is. Yeah, you find this here in this line pattern, and we also indicate what is the intermediate level that we go through. And what is now interesting is that uh, you, when you have a, a molecular signal like this one, yeah, um, in the signet, um, yeah, so, so this, is, this is the data for for the singlet pairs, for the singlet uh, Rempi pairs, then you also find the same molecular signal in the triplet pairs. Yeah? So this is here signal for the triplet pairs. And um, why is that? Well, because our molecules are in this uh, hyperfine state. And this hyperfine state is a superposition, a quantum superposition of singlet and triplet. Yeah? So, so every molecule, every molecular state gives rise to signals uh, for this MP pairs and also for that MP pairs. So we have kind of a fingerprint for each molecular signal. Okay, and here we want to compare uh, the different experiments we did, uh, the different MP pairs that we tried with the theory calculations. So you see these pillars, they have different colors. These three colors correspond to different MP pairs. Yeah, where we detect the molecules, and in green, this is the theory. And uh, so here you see these different pillars. Down here, you have uh, the vibrational and the rotational quantum number. So the vibrational quantum number goes from minus one to minus four. The rotation goes from zero to about six. And down here, you see the different uh, binding energies that correspond to these levels. Yeah, we go from about, yeah. 150 megahertz to 12 gigahertz or so. And on the y-axis, you see the ion production rate. This is what we measure, but that is proportional to the molecular production rate. And on the right-hand side, you see the calculated uh, rate constant, three-body recombination rate constant. And actually, the ion production rate should be proportional to this uh, rate constant but we have just some uh, scaling factors, uh, global scaling factors to compare all these things. So what you see here is that uh, 
all these calculations and data, they're actually pretty consistent with each other. So that, that tells us that our interpretation is good and that our experimental scheme and also that our calculations work quite well. The theory is actually a single spin model. So no spin is flip is allowed. And you see now because it agrees so well or, yeah, uh, with our data that uh, it's all consistent and it's very reassuring. So let's now try to understand uh, why we see the spin conservation also for rubidium 85. Yeah? And um, there are a couple of conditions that are easy to understand yeah? that must be fulfilled so that we can have this uh, spin conservation. And the first one is if you want to produce a molecule with these quantum numbers, that molecule better exist. Yeah? So that's what we're going to check, whether these molecules exist in rubidium-85. The second point is, if you want the atoms A and B to produce, yeah, to, to have their spins conserved, they better not exchange spin with atom C. Yeah? So in that sense, we need atom C to be a, to, to be a spectator spin-wise, yeah, to only interact with A and B via mechanical forces. And we're going to see how this can work out. And then third, when you initially prepare atom A and B with these quantum numbers, and now they approach each other, they collide to form the molecule, uh, they can in principle undergo spin exchange, yeah? so change the F quantum numbers, and they better not do that. Uh, at least uh, that it must be that this uh, spin admixture of these other channels must be relatively small. So we see how this comes about. So now we're going to step through these different conditions. Conditions number one was we're looking for molecular states that have these quantum numbers. And you can see that this is normally not the case. Yeah, just imagine you have here a singlet state deeply bound here, that singlet state cannot have these quantum numbers because uh, these quantum numbers need to have a superposition of singlet and triplet. So this will only work up here for very weakly bound molecular states. And so that's what we're now going to look at. So I zoom into this here. And this is now yeah, the zoom. You have the internuclear distance, the energy. We are close to zero. And this here, lying exactly on top of each other, is actually the singlet and triplet uh, potential. And let's, for the moment, now just turn off the hyperfine interaction. Yeah? Then you have independently bound states of triplet and singlet states. And if now, by any chance, the singlet and triplet bound states are energetically degenerate, then you can see here that the vibrational wave function, yeah, they must, singlet and triplet, they must be essentially the same. Yeah? And um, if they are now degenerate, you can also understand that uh, it, there's no cost at all to rearrange the spins at uh, you know, how we want them to, to be arranged. So we can arrange them uh, to have the atomic hyperfine structure. Yeah? And so that's actually when we now turn on the hyperfine interaction, that's what's happening. The hyperfine interaction will create uh, this atomic hyperfine structure. And even if there is a finite splitting between singlet and triplet that is smaller than the hyperfine coupling strings, yeah, then it will still arrange these levels to have this atomic hyperfine structure. Only if this splitting between singlet and triplet is larger than, than the hyperfine. Then this doesn't work anymore, and you will rather have singlet and triplet states rather than these atomic hyperfine states. So now what is interesting is that you can uh, uh, divide this energy range here into energy bins. And in every energy bin, there is exactly one singlet and one triplet state. And now it depends on the scattering length, let's say, of a singlet or a triplet, where these levels are located within the energy bin. So if the uh, scattering length for the singlet, for example, is large and positive, you can find this bound state here at the top of the energy bin. And 
if, for example, for the triplet, it's large and negative, you will find the triplet bound state close to the, to the bottom of the bin. And so now in this case, yeah, where you have, uh, you know, large singlet and, and, and large but negative triplets scattering lengths, you see that just at the border of the bins, singlet and triplet meet. And so now their energy splitting is very small and hyperfine interaction can now couple those to have that hyperfine structure. And that's exactly what's happening in, our, in the case of rubidium 85, yeah? We have these guys now being mixed by hyperfine interaction, and this is how these uh, quantum numbers come about. So you see, rubidium 87 was a special case, rubidium 85 is a special case. Nature has a lot of special cases. Um, so we, we covered point number one, yeah? So we do have, yeah, um, and we found a scheme to, to kind of investigate whether a molecule has these quantum numbers. So now on to point number two, how can we make sure that atom C is just a, a spectator uh, spin-wise? So for this, we're gonna again start out doing uh, two-body physics, yeah? So we are gonna look at uh, the interaction between the particles uh, on a, a two-body basis. And so we have again the singlet and the triplet uh, uh, potentials, uh, that is the internuclear distance. But what is now interesting actually that there are characteristic length scales that will help us. So we have the van der Waals length here, the van der Waals radius. And that gives you roughly also the size of the molecules that we're interested in. Then you have the exchange interaction radius. Now this uh, radius is the, the spot where the hyperfine interaction between uh, yeah, uh, of the atom equals to the splitting between the triplet and singlet potential curves. So for radii larger than this uh, exchange interaction radius, um, hyperfine interaction dominates and it will protect your hyperfine states from spin flipping. For smaller distances, uh, the exchange interaction dominates and it will lead to spin flips between uh, yeah, hyperfine levels. So that's one important uh, length scale here. And another one is this RHF. This is the hyperfine interaction radius. So if you zoom into these potential curves here, you see that they actually split up at larger distances corresponding to the atomic asymptotes. Yeah? Uh, so the quantum number F it can be two or three, and there's a splitting here of the hyperfine splitting, three gigahertz or so. Now we come in, in our experiment, at the level of two, two. And let's say we have a collision of two atoms, and, that ha and then down here at short distances, there's a spin flip that takes place. Now when the two atoms separate again, you see that there's actually here two spin barriers, two barriers, potential barriers, and so only the F22 can come out again because of, you know, energy constraints. So is that, that way, somehow the two atoms, once they are again at that distance, they have forgotten that they have undergone uh, a spin exchange. Yeah, they're kind of in a zone of oblivion. Yeah. Um, okay, and that's going to be important also for our argument. So what we're going to ask now is what is the typical distance for the reaction to take place? And that is, um, yeah, for this, we look into three-body collision theory, yeah? And it turns out that uh, these reactions happen at a hyper radius of about 1.5 times the van der Waals radius. And what is the uh, hyper radius? Yeah, you take the distance between the particles R and D here, you square them, add them up, and that's about the hyper radius squared. Now, it turns on, out that, um, this, this formation happens at this large distance, effectively because there is a barrier at about two times the van der Waals radius. And we talked about this before, like yesterday or so. Um, and this is uh, what you see here. Yeah, so here you have plotted the potential energy curves for the effective adiabatic potential. Um, 
as a function of the hyper radius and you come in with this level here and then you see at two times the van der Waals radius there's this uh, barrier that comes up that keeps the particles effectively at a distance they can you know tunnel into here a little bit and react but but you know they will not come really really close and so the next argument is now if we now put in a typical radius of the molecule that we create then we can determine what is the distance of atom c from atom b and from atom a and it turns out when we do this for our uh, you know molecules that we consider this a distance of uh, uh, atom C is always larger than the hyperfine distance. And so, of course, then also always larger than the exchange distance. So this means atom C is in the zone of, uh, you know, oblivion. Yeah. So it is in its state F equal to MF minus two. And spin wise, it is only a spectator. So that explains that. Yeah. And the atoms A and B, they are in their closed yeah, spin, uh, yeah, spin state. Um, so now comes point number three. Um, now we consider the two atoms A and B colliding. They have been prepared initially in these quantum states, but what prevents them from undergoing a spin flip and then creating a, a molecule in a different spin channel? Yeah. So we want to make sure that the admixture of other spin channels is small. And for this, we look again at our two-body potentials. This is the internuclear distance. In red, this is zero energy. And the scattering state is just above uh, zero energy. And just below zero energy, there's, of course, the last bound state. And you can see that the last bound state and the scattering state they actually share is exactly or uh, the same uh, potentials um, and have essentially the same energy. So therefore, their scattering wave functions will be essentially the same. And as we have just discussed before, we said that these weakly bound states, they have, uh, you know, these quantum numbers here, they are good quantum numbers for the last bound state. So they will also be good quantum numbers then for the scattering state. So, um, yeah. And if you do the calculations, you indeed find yeah, that, that the admixture of other spin channels to the scattering state is really uh, very small on the percent level or so. And here I show you the wave functions for uh, rubidium-85, yeah, two colliding atoms. Uh, this is the bound state, yeah, as a function of the internuclear distance. And you see the, um, the, um, the hyperfine state we're interested in is this blue one. It's dominating. And for distances smaller than the hyperfine radius, you see there's a little bit of an admixture of this uh, red spin channel and the black spin channel. Yeah? And out here, there's nothing. Now, so there is a little bit of an admixture. And you see that the scattering wave functions at these distances and smaller distances they're essentially the same. So that that's also explains now how this comes about. So what have we learned? Yeah, so um, I, yeah, whenever we have now an element and we want to see, uh, can we expect spin conservation? We should look yeah, at this ratio rho, uh, the ratio between the singlet and triplet levels splitting and compare that to this hyperfine um, Splitting, and if this is smaller than one, then we will have bound states, molecular bound states with these quantum numbers. And then we should also check whether there is a separation of these different length scales that I talked about, the exchange interaction length scales, the hyperfine length scale in the Van der Waals length scales, because this will help that the uh, atom C uh, is far enough away so that it interacts uh, spin independently uh, with the other two atoms, so that it's in the zone of oblivion. Okay, so I want to conclude. I talked about three-body recombination of rubidium-85, and we saw that despite the fact that there are these very different uh, scattering lengths uh, for the single and triplet state, uh, the, spin con the spin is conserved, yeah? the hyperfine spin. And we kind of worked out some conditions for this to, to exist. 
Um, so there's this ratio rho and there's the separation of length scale. Now in the future would be perhaps interesting and nice to go even deeper uh, and to see at what point, at what binding energies, this propensity rule will uh, you know, not hold anymore. And also interesting if you find an example where from the beginning there's some spin mixing in the scattering channel, perhaps because of a Feshbach resonance, and, uh, and see how this changes the story. Or also look at other elements, for example, like lithium or potassium, where these conditions are not fulfilled, and therefore there should be um, a breakdown of the spin propensity rule. Thanks very much for your attention. Questions to your hands? Okay, first. And, okay. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to know uh, the um, uh, scaling rule that you found. Is it over which range of energy is that, does it hold? Is it the Van der Waals range of energy? Yeah, so, um, so this energy sca uh, um, scaling rule, um, we have done experiments down to about 12 gigahertz. Yeah? And, uh, and the, the calculations also roughly go down to this right now. Um, it could be, uh, if we go more further down, that the scaling rule also will change a little bit. Yeah? Um, but, but right now, yeah, it looks at least roughly yeah, that uh, perhaps it will not change too strongly. Yeah? So roughly, our rule, uh, our rule of thumb is, um, the probability should go roughly down like one over the binding energy. Yeah, that's. Okay, so my, my question was actually, do you, do you think it's related to the Van der Waals uh, character of the potential or is it more general or? That's a good point, yeah. So Jing Lun um, made some calculations um, with, uh, in a perturbative fashion using this AGS uh, approach and so he plugged in the different potentials, one going like one over R to the three, but also one over R to the four. And uh, lo and behold, he essentially found the same scaling. So that's, uh, that's very exciting, I think, yeah? Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Some I didn't quite understand what, what the phrase propensity rule refers to. Does it refer to the scaling with the energy, with the power of 0 0.8, or does it refer to spin selection rules? Or? So, so we have two, two propensity rules, yeah? So one was about uh, spin conservation. That's mainly what I talked about, yeah? So you prepare these hyperfine states, and you find that the hyperfine states are still the same in the molecular product. So that's, that's number one. And number two was uh, about, you know, uh, what is the product distribution, uh, just looking at, or, or what is the probability distribution for, for products as a function of a binding energy? Yeah. So as you go to more and more deeply bound molecules, uh, the probability to produce these molecules goes down. But how does it go down? It goes down roughly like one over the binding energy. Yeah, Eric? For the vibrational propensity rules, is that power law uh, just a, a measure of the populations, or is it somehow a convolution of the populations and the Frank Condon factor between the bound states and the intermediate state of your REMPI? Yeah, that's a very important experimental question. Yeah, and uh, so so that actually is what makes it a little bit hard. Yeah, uh, to check this. But uh, we looked at uh, Frank Condon factors that Eberhard Thiemann calculated. And, um, and so there, uh, it should be that, uh, that we are saturated for the first tr transition. Um, and, um, and, and so essentially, uh, the data that I showed you is then really the probability, the, the population of these bound states, yeah? So yeah, we've, we tried to take this out, yeah? Of course, because that's not interesting, yeah? 
More questions? To, okay. So, as I understand, you're not near a, um, an FMOV resonance in the initial state because you're, I think, doing the experiment at, at zero magnetic field or, or close to that. But it seems like it would be really interesting to go to like 155 Gauss in uh, rubidium 85 where you have uh, the two body Feshbach resonance and you could do the experiment in, a, in an FMOV resonance. Uh, have you considered doing that? Because then the complex would have more time in this resonating state. The complex would have more time to have a spin exchange as opposed to, I believe, what your experiment does. You just come in and go out uh, in a non-resonant fashion. Yeah, that's of course you know an excellent question. Yeah, and we've also uh, we looked into this and uh, we've measured data and uh, we do see that things happen. Yeah, and these things are being written up right now. Uh, maybe I should know this, but. Uh, how many ion, molecular ions do you have by the, when you simultaneously? Right? How many molecular ions? Molecular ions ah. do you have? So, so the if you see a signal like this, yeah, the typical ion range that we have is between uh, one and seventy, something like this. Yeah, so it's it's a, still a relatively small number. Yeah. If we, if we have uh, many more ions than 70, it's actually hard to know how many we have. Yeah? So we, we do the experiment in such a way that, uh, that this ion number doesn't get too large. Okay. okay. So I, I was basically wondering if uh, we could think recombination has a, a way to produce molecular ions, right? but I'm not sure if these numbers are competitive because there are people that are interested in molecular ions. Just can't tell. Do you know anything about it? Um, okay, so you mean uh, the rubidium two plus ions, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, of course, yeah. We produce these rubidium two plus ions, and uh, in a way, um, they are often not very stable. Uh -huh. Yeah. And um, how long they live? So it turns out when they collide with rubidium. Yeah, uh, there's a good chance, or after after a number of collisions, that the rubidium two plus ion uh, becomes a rubidium plus ion again. Yeah, and then you you have a formation of neutral rubidium two. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I was. Intrigued by your observable, which I guess is the the ion rattling around in the ion trap and kicking out neutral atoms, is it kicking out neutral atoms because the ion is uh, highly vibrationally excited and therefore uh, is sort of a, a toxic element that that uh, it hits the neutral atom and decays, or is it kicking out because it has a lot of kinetic energy? And if it has kinetic energy, is that from the electron recoil after the photoionization. What makes this ion so dangerous to the neutral atoms? So, so we have a Paul trap, and the Paul trap it exhibits micro motion. Yeah, it's it's a driven trap. So, so and with the micro motion, actually, we don't even compensate it very uh, much. Yeah. So, so there is there's a significant uh, energy in this ion. Yeah, let's say 10 millikelvin or so. And when it collides uh, elastically with the atoms, then the atoms get, you know, a kick and, and energy, and they are kicked out of their shallow trap. Yeah? So, so that's, there's nothing complicated about it. It's just that this iron is really, you know, zooming around uh, and, 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 and kicking atoms elastically. There can also be inelastic processes, but we're not interested in this uh, for this story here, and it doesn't make a difference. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah, okay, it's working. Um, so you are um, showing that the study of the 
you know, the, the breakdown of the propensity rules, you actually connect this to, um, to the situation where the F is not a good quantum number anymore. Um, right, at least this is what is noted here. Um, but then actually the condition, if I understand correctly, is uh, the separation of length scale is most strongly uh, required conditions here. So, and this is not necessarily the case, right? So for example, you know, uh, if I'm going to my lovely atom, which is lithium, you get that the F is still a good number, right? But the separation of scale is not correct anymore. So yeah, exactly. Situation... So for lithium, yeah, you have an exchange, uh, which is actually an exchange length, which is kind of close to the Van der Waals length, yeah. And, and close so, to so, hyperfine, so the yeah. atom C basically, yeah, never gets so far away uh, that it is not spin exchanging with the other atoms yeah so so probably then this will not be good you know for the spin conservation yeah is that what you what you were yeah so okay. the f the f number is still a good quantum number but this is not a necessary condition right uh, to um, see the, well uh, you have to also look at this and for lithium this is also pretty pretty bad pretty quickly yeah Actually, I think already the, the second bounce set or the first bounce, I haven't, I don't know anymore, uh, is already heavily spin mixed. Yeah. So the hyperfine state uh, of, of these bounce states are rather singlet and triplet than atomic hyperfine. Yeah. What, what's the technical reason? Why don't you detect the ions directly, but rather with this indirect fault trap trick? Historic reasons. Yeah. We, um, <clears throat> we, uh, we have the setup with a Paul trap and, and we realized all of a sudden that, you know, we had these, these ions in there and then we traced back these ions. They come from, uh, from molecules and then we worked out a scheme that works nicely for us to, to detect uh, the molecules like this. Although I have to say we do have also a channel ton or, uh, uh, in our, in our setup. But for some magic reason, none of, none of us have, have actually then said, okay, let's try out what, what we see on the channel one. So it's something that we should do. Yeah. Other questions? Otherwise I have mine. Uh, I understand that these propensity rules depends a lot on the short distance behavior of your pair wave function. But you are treating even at these solar energies with a three body system. And it's not, uh, it seems not too relevant, this three body dynamics in the entrance channel. And this was a puzzle to me. <laughs> yeah, so, so somehow, and I find this interesting, yeah, this is a three body process, yeah, but a lot we can explain just looking at the two body sector, yeah, what's happening on the two body level. Not completely, yeah. So one important part is is this here, yeah. Looking at the um, the hyper radius, and it tells us that the particles uh, for the reactions they don't get all very close, yeah. They are they are kind of kept at a, at a distance, yeah. So the three of them are kept at a distance, and that is very important for us, I think, yeah. Um, but other than that, all the other arguments were essentially. Uh, two body arguments. We have time for a quick question. Okay, so let us thank uh, Johannes and Miguel.